Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Ball Poetry Podcast, where today we are going to talk to poet Jeff Taylor. Jeff has been in the Blood Rag, he has been in the Bloodshed Review. Jeff also hosts the uh, Garage Poets Open Mic Night. We talk about all sorts of shit. Let me let me go down some of the list here. We talk about the Beat, Stone Soup, Jack Powers, Billy Barnum, the Can Tab, working out your poems, uh, poetry slams, channeling your poems, the Muse, revision, and then we start talking about capitalism and risk in art and. Um, We even go so far to talk about Drake and Amana Marth. So if any of that wets your effing whistle, hold on to your short and curlies, because we're about to go on a little trip, everybody. So yeah. I don't know, I'm trying to make this quick because this episode is going to be a long one. That's what she said. Let's just get on with it. How did you start Garage Poets? Well, um, when the pandemic hit, um, me and my friend Anna had been talking about creating like an online community for for artists to meet. At first, we were kind of like as an open mic, but also just as a place for for us all to touch base and kind of see where everybody's everybody's minds were at just because it was a very chaotic time. We all went through it. You know, we all know. So we wanted to make sure there was a place that we each week we were all meeting and kind of checking in with each other. And if sh- shit hit the fan, then we would at least have each other that we were communicating with, you know. And how did that grow? Slowly. So I'm from I'm from the Boston area, and um, this, the Boston Poetry Slam is at the Cantab Lounge in Cambridge. And um, I've always I've gone there since late '90s, early 2000s, somewhere in there. So some people that I knew from there were coming. Some local people were coming, and then my my friend Anna, who is the co-host, she has a lot of internet friends from different internet boards, and so they they were they they were also coming. It was like a, a weird mix of like people that would do like kind of politically minded rants, and then people that were doing like spoken word poems, and then just kind of more confessional poems as well. So there, there was a, a mix of different art forms written and spoken art forms kind of right off the bat which i I kind of kind of helped draw the crowd in i i feel like it helped everybody connect on a more human level yeah i I think people started coming more for the camaraderie people come for the camaraderie i think and so now you're how often are you doing that we're we're down to once a month now we stay we were weekly for quite a while Uh, as we grew and became more of a poetry focused and, and less of a place for people just to come and hang out and talk to each other i still wanted to keep that aspect of it alive mm-hmm. so the first hour is always the fireside chat i like to, like to call it where um we just all hang out and um just kind of talk about what's been going on with ourselves the past since the last time we got together so how do people find that we have a facebook group and i i I guess the the platform has grown most through Facebook. There's a like, lot of on, there's a lot of online open mics that um use Facebook to promote their open mics. I would go to a lot of those open mics and then but some of those people f- found my open mic and they and they started coming. So, how long have you been doing the poetry thing, man? How did you get into it? I I've, I've been writing poetry since like the mid '90s, the first time I wrote, wrote wrote something I intended other people to to listen to. Me and my friend Jen, um, she was babysitting, and um, the the baby's parents went away to Maine, and it was somebody that my friend Jen worked with was was the mom, and, and um, so her and her husband went away, and um, she was babysitting, and her her and her boyfriend and and, and me were were over there. We were hanging out. She had just put the baby to bed. I was sitting in the living room while she was putting the baby to bed and, and doing that stuff. So I'm sitting there in the living room and all of a sudden walks in Jen and hands me the baby and says, I think something's wrong. I, I, I think she didn't even say anything, to be honest with you. She just handed me the baby. And I started feeling the baby go cold in my hands. Um, the baby had died from SIDS. Oh, shit. So she just hands, hands me the baby and I'm like, I really think something's wrong with this baby. So I start going towards them and like freaking out like, hey, something's wrong. Call 911. They're like, we already did. I'm like, well, why didn't you tell me something was wrong then? And they're like, well, we just wanted to make sure. I'm like, oh, thanks. So I wrote a poem 
for that baby and that was the first poem that i wrote that i intended other people to hear well well that's fucking crazy but um that's a heavy fucking story who were you reading like who who got you into poetry like what kind of stuff were you into Oh, the beat generation definitely is what um really started like lighting my fire to want to write and perform poetry and to kind of like became part of my world more when I discovered the beat generation. Read on the road was my first introduction. I really I really got into on the road the storytelling and the the lives of the people how they reflected real lives. I, I really drew me in. Is Kerouac your favorite beat? He's the one that really got me into it definitely. But I I think. Ginsburg maybe is my favorite or course so around the mid 90s even out here beats were really popular but were the beats really popular in the Boston scene back then Kerouac definitely st- still left a huge impression yeah and definitely the the people that were kind of like the elders of the scene were definitely leftovers from the from the beats and the kind of continuing generations you see a lot of like johnson and claire would come around a lot did you have a lot of like the confessional stuff in your area at that time too not really not that i was exposed to anyways so, so maybe may, i'm sure there was but i just not not so much that i was exp- exposed to i'm like i'm trying to figure out like when kind of the the new york school kind of died or like when it stopped being what it was and because like it it makes me because like in san francisco like you go to san francisco and the san francisco renaissance still feels like it's happening right now and like Uh like the beats feel like they're still happening right now so like trying to figure out like when the new york scene like the New York school scene stopped really focusing on that or if they ever did, or if it's just like New York to Boston is such like a huge chasm for like what like certain poetry is in New York to what it is in Boston. Yeah. I don't, I don't think there's that big of a chasm between New York and, and Boston as far as poetry world goes just from, cause I, I've been down to New York a bunch and, and I'm, I, I think this what I, I see New York is has a very wide this has a wider breadth of of a poetry world definitely so there's more different things that you that you can find like is it more like culturally diverse than Boston It's more artistically diverse anyways Yeah okay I'm, and there's a lot more people. There's a lot more sections. So sure, to some extent, that's true. I feel like Boston's is more. I it's harder for me to say. I guess because I live in Malden. And in the Malden public schools, there's like 50-something languages spoken. So I come from a very diverse community. So I'm, I'm, I get maybe I just see it as more diverse than it is. Were you a part of the Stone Soup thing? Stone Soup, is that's like where I first started reading poetry. At the, the, op, the open mic, that when I first started going to open mics, it was, it was, the first one was Stone Soup. My friend Pete um, took me to Stone Soup. I lived in Florida for like less than a year. And then when I moved back, my friend Pete had started going to Stone Soup. So he took me there. Because that's been around forever, right? Yeah, that's been around for over 50 years. 52 years continuously. Fuck, dude, that's nuts, man. Yeah. Uh, So like... Jack Powers is the the founder, was the poet Jack Powers. He um, had a profound effect on my early poetry in... um, he really gave me a lot of the courage to keep going with it and um you know made me feel like there was I had something to offer what poets kind of came through there the people that I, that that have left their left their mark with me was um Jack Powers starting with him um Billy Barnum who is kind of like a mime poet he's a, like into dance and mime that he kind of puts into his performances you'd see him you'd see him out on the streets of Harvard Square doing like gorilla performances and um he would really draw the crowds in with the mime and the dance so watching him perform really make me want to see how performance can lend to your poetry can really like bring bring out new ways of looking at what the words that you're saying did he do like full like french mime or was it just like yeah like (laughs) at at times anyways that like he could do that you know he would do those types of performance but, but he would bring aspects of that into his 
poetry performances. That's wild. Yeah, because I can I can think of like if he be, be like talking about a box. There's like one poem where that he starts off and he's doing like the full mime thing, and and you you really can you you really see it. He was oh. Billy Barnum. He was like um one of the last surviving members of the the Barnum family from the Barnum and Bailey Circus. Oh shit, that's yeah. rad. Yeah, I didn't put that together. Huh. Yeah, I toured with him. There was the, the um, Barnum and Buddha Poetry Circus. We toured. We went to like Woodstock, mostly like northeast of yeah. of, of the U.S. We, we, a bunch of states around here. Uh, so that that was that was a big big blast early on in my career. The early two thousands, travel around with with Billy was awesome. Besides that, have you done a lot of traveling um, with your poetry since then? So I, I was in this other group. Uh, Dr. Brown's traveling poetry show started by Michael Brown, who was um, the host at the Cantab for the Boston Poetry Slam, and um, we we did I did some tra- did some traveling around with them as well. But that show was pretty cool. That was like so there would be like ten poets. Say it was a different number each time. It w- we'd go one poet right after another. So I'd like one per one poet would go, and right a- after their last line. The next poet would come in, but they would be like standing in another part of the room. Mm-hmm. We had like a weekly performance at um, Jimmy Tingle's Off Broadway Theater in um, Davis Square, but it's, now it's just called the Davis Square Theater. And um, it's kind of like a, in the, a theater in the round. So one person would be here, and then one person would come in from here without missing a beat, and um, so forth throughout throughout the show. So the the crowd would be like constantly looking around. And the poems would kind of weave together a theme. Nice. Um, not, yeah. So it, the theme wasn't always super strict. It was just kind of based off of what we had, but it had a really cool storyline. That's really interesting. Do you think there's a lot of importance in like a traveling poetry show? I don't know. What do you mean by importance? I don't know if it's because of the internet, but that just seems like a very foreign concept now, at least. At the same time, to someone like me, that sounds like the most amazing thing ever it was awesome did that help your creativity did it help your writing did it help get your name out like what were the positive benefits of it besides the actual performance i mean it definitely helped me get my um creativity out it definitely helped me expand my um my writing and my creativity just con- just constantly out there performing ostensibly the same poems you know i'd write new poems but i'd be performing the same poems repeatedly a lot and um, you kind of see new things in those poems and sometimes I'd be like editing the poems as as I'm reading them like one night I'll read it and be like oh maybe this didn't hit as good maybe I'll change this part up or sometimes just like in the middle of reading it I'll think of a different line and I'll just start reading start performing that new line and then that becomes part of the poem so how do you think that differs from just kind of like working poems through open mics just the consistency of it and um doing it more in like a in like a show versus an open mic a lot of times people you you get more the crowd is more responding to what you're doing potentially because they're seeing more more of you and they're there to see you versus like at an open mic maybe half half the crowd is really just there to read their own poem you know yeah yeah yeah. so how long did you do that one for that went for the michael brown's poetry show that 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 went for like five years oh shit that that was was pretty long lasting yeah we we we, um we performed that first night at the in boston first night which was pretty cool we did that like five nights five years in a row at the um the heinz convention center so that last thing ended what like what would that be 2007 um yeah around there so like when i started call i went to college in 2006 and i kind of started to let it wane in 2006 okay the and- last year it was in existence I, I i didn't really perform that much with the group and then your poetry career what happened after 2006 w- went to college when i was in college i i was still writing i wasn't really um performing as much I, here and there but no more than like once or twice a year really school was taking so much of my extra time that and also in 2007 me and my wife had our first child so our a daughter was born so with college and the new child yeah I, did, I just didn't have time for performing so I put that on the, the back burner so I could get a 
career, I always knew I would kind of find my way back towards poetry. Though. So did that happen through Garage Poets? Coming back to poetry? Yeah. No, no, because 2015, Adam Stone put together anthology for, for the Cantaf, for the Boston Poetry Slam. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a big, um, really big book, uh, anthology of all poets that have come through the, um, the Boston Poetry Slam. The way that the poets were selected is by people that were still going to the Cantab or people that he reached out to to say, what poems do you remember? I'm putting this together, this anthology. What poems stand out to you that, that I need to have in this book? And um, one of my poems um, came up. Casey Rochiteau, who's a poet, for, she's in um, Ohio now, brought up my poem, Shortcut, so that that poem got in, in the anthology. When the book came out, we had a reading of the anthology so we invited all the poets that were in the anthology to come and read their poem and um we actually didn't end up reading our own poem we ended up swapping poems and uh, re reading each other's poems which ended up being cooler nice I got to read on billy barnum's poem but yeah being in that anthology got me to, to keep going back to the cantab more and i started writing more poems they seemed to be clicking with the the folks that were going around 25 2015 2016 so you were doing slams before that then right well i was going to the boston poetry slam but i didn't really slam i never really liked the idea of competing with other poets you yeah know, it, it's i did it once in a while but I, I was never really good at it. Maybe that's why I didn't like it because I was I just I didn't really fare well in the competition. So maybe maybe that had to, maybe if I did better, maybe I would have liked it more. I don't know. I did a lot. I do a lot of performance poetry, but I didn't do and I did a with the slam poets, but I didn't do a lot of slams. I went to this um poetry cross training course, and it was probably like one of the biggest like step ups that I've ever made in poetry after after taking taking this course. It was at um. NYU SUNY, one of the, one of the SUNYs, the state universities in, for New York. Oneonta, I think it was. So Patricia Smith, who is like one of the a slam poetry icons, she was like one of the people that started it back in Chicago. She also w was one of the hosts at the Boston Poetry Slam, but she, she was um, one of the teachers at this course. Her and um, Reggie Gibson and um, Taylor Molly. A few other people, but um, specifically those three had a, a huge impact on my um, writing with the intent of evoking emotions from people. Yeah, and, like really being able to like hit with the audience, and not just in a performance, but also with the written, with just your written word as well. Because yeah. like people like Patricia Smith, she's really known for her poetry performances, but also now is really also really known for. Her, just being deadly with her pen in general, you know. PSI Poetry Slam in Incorporated, I, that's who put together the um, poetry cross training course I took. It was like a week long. We went and um, stayed at the college. From that, that I really, my um, my writing process really has formed to what to what it is now. So like when you first are writing a poem, I'm I'm like first getting that first burst of inspiration. I feel like it's like you kind of channeling it from somewhere else. Yeah, and then there's like an abundance of information that's coming through your body, and, and your body is only capable of spitting out so much of that information. Kind of like an internet internet connection gets overwhelmed with too much audio and video. Well, it's kind of similar to that. There's like a how much you can possibly absorb at one point or spit out at one point. So that first time that you're writing. You're getting just parts of it. You don't. You're not getting the whole thing. It's. It's really not even trying to deliver the whole thing to you at that. In that. In that first shot. For me, it's like I'm just kind of like spitting it out and trying to get the the framework done on that on that first first pass. And I like to do it on a notebook because it's definitely not going to live in the notebook forever. It needs to be transferred to the computer at some point. So that moving it, typing it from the notebook to the, to the laptop or um ho however even if, like even if i intend like i'll go into it intending just to type what i wrote but then i start to get hit with that same inspiration again or the rest of that inspiration set like the things that i missed in that first pass through start to come out i, I see where i cloud sometimes i'll it'll be a little cloudy i, I won't, it won't be as clear what i'm trying to say 
Okay. Or I'll say I'll say it like a little people will start to kind of get the wrong idea about what I'm saying. They'll read different things into it where I, where I can see where that would happen. So I I start to try to clear those things up and make them the message of the poem more clear. Is it like something when you first get that burst of information, like inspiration that hits? Are you just trying to like write down all the ideas that are coming? Or when you're doing that first draft, are you trying to make it into some sort of poem? I'm trying to make it into some sort of poem. I'm, so I'm like... I'm like feel I I'm like feeling the inspiration coming and I'm like kind of like overloaded with it where I guess I could just start writing a whole bunch of stuff but it wouldn't really make it too much sense to me. Mm-hmm. So I try to like I try to like take in a whole bunch of it and and try to like con- condense that down into like one sentence that's going to that's going to mean something or yeah. that's going to evoke some sort of emotion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then once I get that first sentence down because like everything hinges on that first sentence. Mm-hmm. And then that first sentence kind of then tells me where to go next. Sometimes it's like I expand on that, sometimes I move sometimes it's it wants to, wants me to pivot in a whole other direction, but I don't really I won't really know that until I'm like really sitting with it. So then how many times do you have to go over a poem before you're happy with it or is it something that's never ending? Oh, it's like an unlimited amount of times. Cuz like that's then like the third time is really I feel like where I start to create. Mm-hmm. That's where I like I try to like start to put my creative energy into what what is on the page. I kind of like read through what I've what I've what I've written, what's which almost has been like channeled through me in a way, and I kind of like absorb that, and then I I start to put my own thoughts and creativity into what what is on the page. That's probably like the third pass. When you say you're channeling stuff. Um... Like, where do you think that comes from? The muse. I mean, that's like corny and cliche, but I, re- I really think that there's like... I totally agree. Like, you're fine. That's really what it is. I really feel like that's what it is. There's literally some sort of energy force out there that sends me this. I'm somehow... Like, we're all, we're all connected to the universe in various ways, like every single person is. By your third draft, that's when, like, you feel the art is happening. Like you feel like that's where you get to be creative now. Yes. Yes. Talk about that because like you also say like you could do like numerous drafts after that point. So how do you know when something's done? When I read it through and I understand and and I, and I think that it's my points are as clear as I, as they can be in my image, the images that I'm creating and the metaphors that I'm, putting out um are as are as clear as, as they can be like i keep reading it through and reading it through and i'm like well i really like this part but i think this part's not as strong as this part so then i try to like kind of like punch up the part that i don't think is as strong which sometimes it can't really be punched up in the way it is so i have to like totally like start at point zero with that point part again sometimes i'll like oh i like these first three stanzas but then the next three stanzas i don't like it all that much and I'll yeah. work with them, not really be able to get anywhere with it. So I'll just get rid of those last three stanzas. And I'll only keep the first three stanzas. And I'll start writing it as if it was a new poem. But I have these first three stanzas already. Sometimes a lot of my my favorite poems, I I I I've like wrote like two years ago, and I never really was a hundred percent satisfied with how they were. And then like two years later, I'll come and I'll look at it and I'll get this inspiration. I'll be like, oh, this is what this poem needs. Yeah. And now now that poem is like my, one of my favorite poems. So are you a fan of that whole thing? Like write a poem, then put it in a drawer and don't look at it for a super long time and then go back to it? I, I think that works. I, I don't know that I necessarily do that super intentionally. I, my intention is to make it as good as it can be right away but sometimes that's just isn't you know you're dealing with the muse is giving you this creativity and this inspiration so maybe they just they gave you what they could at the time and you didn't hear it fully so now they're kind of not wanting to talk to you about it anymore for a while and do you think the muse is something that comes and goes i think it's always there with you but is it whether or not it's like spitting out information to you i I think it wants you to learn like like you asked me like with like some poems i gotta put them down and then come back so maybe the the muse maybe there was something in life that I needed to learn 
or experience before I could finish that poem. And I think it knows that. You did um, Shipwreck Paradox. There were a couple times when like I had the the final copy and then you were like, wait, 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 like, let me, let me mess with this and let me change this and let me do that. So when that was happening, was that because it was being put in a type of collection or was it you just like looking at individual poems going, I need to fix this or I need to change that? It was because it was going into a collection and I wanted to have the right poems in the right order. Yeah. So with Shipwreck Paradox, it really hinges on, there's like, there's two parts to one poem, struggling with Zeno's Paradox, and then American Brick struggling with Zeno's Paradox. It kind of moves through America and like me, how I view living in America, starting out in like the early 2000s to now. So like Zeno's Paradox, I originally wrote it in like two. Th- 2005 or something like that it's still the, it's it's like 99 percent still the same as it was when i first wrote it I, it probably took me like a few weeks to write it just because it's kind of long but once i got it in its form it's been that way and I've, I've really have liked it since then but then in the um when the pandemic hit i kind of felt like this shift and i was like looking at this poem and i still liked it but it, it still was, it, and I, it, there was something that wasn't resonating right about it anymore where I felt like it, it needed like a modern update to it. So I was going to update it. My, my original intention was to kind of update that poem and like keep it still just Zeno's Paradox, but a new updated version for 2020. I ended up writing a whole new poem and the, there was like parts of it were the same really just like one or two lines of the same. So at, fir- the, at first I was like, well, how do I like reconcile these two poems existing in the world together, where they like share so so much? And what my my intention was was to kind of rewrite the first poem at first. But then I was like, well, I kind of li- like how they kind of tell a story of like the last twenty years in in, in a way. So they kind of like the same poem but different poems so it's kind of like two parts of the same poem that's cool and and, and it, i think i thought it was really important to have the right poems in between there to kind of like show that shift so it took me a little while to figure out exactly which ones would do that the best because i was limited to page to a page count of how many how many poems could be printed in the book you know <laughs> and um those poems are kind of long, especially the first part of it. It was like five pages. How you were saying, like, like you get inspired and you write something and then you change it and then then you're like, okay, I'm ready for the creative part. Like, I think the difference with me is that I will write something and that will be the thing I write. And then if I have other ideas based on that poem that I think I could like add something to or make something different of or something like that. I'll just write like a new poem. And yeah, I noticed that you just, you'll just write a, new, a whole new poem, right? Yeah. yeah. And so then I'll just kind of go with it like that. If I spend, cause like I've done things where I take like little chunks of stuff that I've done that I just never finish. So let, let's say I start a poem and I only get like four or five lines down And then like something happens and I have to walk away from it when I come back to it, like weeks later or whatever, or try to put that in with something else. Like I'm not the same person I was when I started writing that. Right. So it's like now, no matter what I do, this is going to be completely different, you know, because like just in any given day, like you can have enough like experiences to change who you are a little bit every day. Sure. That, that's like the thing I find that like brings out the like really cool parts in, in poems sometimes is those little bits of growth that you've had mm-hmm. from that experience or since that experience initially help you to see the, that experience in new, new lights and new angles that you can bring out in the poem that you wouldn't have been able to bring out initially. So then with that being said, do you feel like everything you've written prior to the poem you're working on right now is inferior? No, no, not necessarily. No, so, like some of them I do. Once I like once I've gotten brought that poem to a point where I'm like happy with it, I feel like that poem 
is saying what exactly what it needs to say. And if I do happen to have like a new angle on that same experience, if like some big breakthrough happens and I now look at something from a completely different angle, maybe I will go back and rewrite that poem and like add that to it. Even if it's been published, I definitely have poems that I've published places that I've been like, you know what, actually I'm going to totally change that poem now. Yeah. Do you, keep, do you keep the original version like as a part of like your catalog and then have the next version of the same poem? Usually no. Usually I'll just like erase it from the stratosphere as best I can. Yeah. <laughs> Like there are chapbooks float. There's definitely books of mine floating around out there that have like old versions of poems that I think are way better now. Yeah. And I, you know, I would just try to sell that person the new poem, the new version, <laughs> and be like, "No, this this is what you want." So it would be that would be a cool thing that a reader could experience, could have, I, I guess, is seeing like the growth of a poem. But I, like, I I get frantic when I'm creating, so I, I like for real lose the ability to, to to really have that level of organization. And then I like ADHD, autism, when I go back to it, I get bad with organizations. Like I've like had stuff in, like I misunderstand technology sometimes where I've had stuff in Google Drive and I think I'm just deleting it from like my phone and I actually was deleting it from like everywhere. So then I like lost like, so much of my poems. Oh man! I've, so much of my work is just lost. Like I had a house fire, and like every notebook I had since up to that point was just like totally burned away. I had like w- one yeah. one like I was able to dig through emails and like I had e- emailed myself some stuff, so I was able to salvage some stuff. But um, I've I've gotten used to just kind of being disposable about my art. That's probably a, like a healthy way to feel about it. Like I, I can't, I don't think I can do that. Like I, uh, I typically email everything I wrote that month to myself. So like in a couple of days, I'm going to do it again for everything I wrote in October. There is something a little freeing about realizing that your stuff is completely disposable but that sucks that you had to go through what you had to go through to get to that yeah yeah it was it was not it was it was a rough patch it definitely was a it was definitely rough because like it was like that would fucking do me in dude i think that would fucking do me in for sure you were talking about before about um kind of like why art isn't selling now in um what what like what people can do to and I'm just like kind of like you were talking co- like societal causes as to like why art isn't doing as well and like one of your re- re- recent podcasts and that, like I I was kind of in, in other other people have been talking about that same idea because it's obviously it's a topic artists talk about yeah and um it was like I I had a th- thoughts about it capitalism is doing its capitalism thing. Okay. And um, so I first kind of, when I was working in like manufacturing places, I would notice like they started going towards what they were calling like lean manufacturing, where they wanted to account for every moment of the person's day, every like every to the to the second what they were doing, yeah. and making everything the most productive it could possibly be, so that the company is making the most profit they can at all times and they kind of kind of business model makes sense in manufacturing though it also doesn't really like take in mind the spirit of the worker and can that worker keep up um producing at the tops at their top at, at all times and you need kind of like mental breaks in order to be able to stay with with good quality good quality work all the time so quality kind of has has like waned, but production and 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 profits have gone up. Yeah. So that they kind of um, capitalism has kind of taken that and kind of started pointing it at everything because they see they see that it works. 
to them. You know, like maybe the product isn't as good, but that's not the point for them. It's like literally the law that they have to make money for their for the for their shareholders. That has to be their number one intention at all times. Um, so now, but with art, so now that's kind of being focused on movies, music, uh, writing, where there's not as much um, th there's there's not as as much like building up the artist and like finding an artist as a younger and like signing them and giving them enough money to be able to like sustain themselves as they're creating and kind of becoming better and, and building up their fan base and build, building up the quality of their work. Yeah. And, and they're not able to, t um, cause you're, you're taking risks w with art, but they're, they're not putting the time and effort into, into those risks. There's, there's not the, the, um, the, the base of the, um, of the industry, like the, 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 um, the big publishers or the big record labels, aren't putting aren't taking the risks that they used to take because there's not the the money in those in, in taking the risks yeah but the risks is where you get the great art you know that's where that that's where new innovations come from so everything is kind of more in in like a plug and play kind of equ equation mindset and people just kind of spitting out things as much as they possibly can to try to 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 get the whatever they can out of out, out of those little things, but that that's like people will get some people are buying that, but it's not not enough for a for a groundswell. What we're lacking in poetry and in writing right now is like a groundswell of support for a whole movement, kind of like a beat generation or so, something like that. There's not the the investment in the risks that it takes to get there. Well, from what I've been hearing a bunch of, it's that, like, for the most part, most writers and poets were financially well off already before they even started writing. And, like, I don't know about... Well, Kerouac was not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, that was the majority of the people who were, like, popular and shit. So... It, with Kerouac, like, how was he doing anything? Were people, like, sponsoring him and shit like that? Like, people who had money? Well, it was easier than, like, even in Bukowski's day. Yeah. A, a poet could get, like, money from a college to go and do, to, to do performances. And they would get, like, a good amount of money that would be able to, like, pay their bills for that month. Yeah. And you, you wouldn't have yeah. to do as many as many gigs you you could potentially support yourself enough to to get by you know you're probably not going to like be living in the hollywood hills or anything but but did ginsburg push on the road it became well it was huge it kind of like was self published almost in a way it was a manuscript just like loose leaf pages that yeah. were passed from person to person like Hey, look at this! My buddy wrote this. It's fucking awesome. Read okay. it, and then give it to somebody else. And so it just kind of it became like an underground thing that everybody was talking about until um, Ferl and Getty put out City Lights. It was like it was already known at that time, and he put it out. The thing I've always heard about Kerouac is that, like he was such a good looking charismatic guy that like people took care of him you know what i'm saying like yeah i'm sure that that, that, that was part of it definitely okay so basically for a groundswell for poets to do anything they need to be good looking and we need to figure out a way to um sell poets art on the stock exchange <laughs> well you don't forget though the Kerouac went to columbia he was a big sports star he was a uh, he, he was like a sports player and he, he and he went to went to columbia and um so he probably met a lot of like the people his classmates were all probably came from wealthy families yeah but he, he was able like he was like 
on TV and stuff while he was like writing writing his books. He would like be invited to on on, on these TV shows and stuff. So he he was making money that way. So he, there was there was more there was there was more opportunities for for people for poets to make money. The arts in general had more money. Yeah, going to go around now. Now there's like a lot more mostly arts money. I feel like goes to organizations that are like doing stuff in the community versus yeah. going like individual artists that are trying to take risks and push their art in new directions. Yeah, because it seems like the only people who get grants anymore are people who don't need the grants. You know, but like they're the right exactly because they've they've they have a proven track record, so they only want to give money to people that have already done something that has been successful. You know, yeah, exact, that's exactly true. So, what do you think has changed? Do you think it's the assembly line kind of mentality of how? Yeah, it's, so it's like the philosophy of the of the of the money makers, the people. I, that 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 are kind of in charge of how the money is just money is distributed okay. before people had more of a like even like stanley morgan like the, the guy himself had more of a philosoph philosophical kind of bend and like wanted to put more into culture than what we're seeing now a lot of it i think comes down to just the idea that businesses have to make money for their stockholders where that wasn't written into the law before, where they could, there was more room for somebody to say, "Oh, hey, I think this is a good idea for for society. Let's put money towards this." Not that there was a lot of that happening, but at least it was a possible thing. Like, but now it's like not even a possible thing. Do you think that um, with the internet generation and all this stuff that? most companies just haven't figured out how to monetize it properly and that there will be like a resurgence of that kind of thing or do you not think the internet has anything to do with it well there's definitely like room there for it i i wonder i'm like it, it does kind of surprise me in some ways that um there's not some there's not somebody like that's doing a show like you that's also tied to like um one of the like bigger publishers somebody that has like uh, like a deal with a bigger publisher that's also putting out like a poetry podcast and is on YouTube doing 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 different videos I'm surprised that those two things have haven't well found, like, found, they just haven't found the right person that I mean that would be awesome a big five if you're listening or however if a big four big three I don't know who's swallowed up who yet but if you're listening hit me up but um like the poetry foundation has a bunch of different podcasts and some of them are interesting sometimes and some of them are really fucking hard to listen to Denez Smith had one with with somebody else that was like through through like the Poetry Foundation that started that started to get really good, but then that's not it's not out anymore. But um, which one was that called? I want to remember, and I was hoping I would remember as I was talking about it, but I really can't remember the name of it right now. But there was some really good poets on that pot on that poetry podcast. But I think podcasts, if they were doing it now, it would be more they'd get more listens now than they were then. I think just, I think there's more people listening to it now than yeah. there was probably more like 2010. Yeah. There's a lot of podcasts you find on there that were like running in between like 2010 and 2012, you know, and yeah. they're still up there, but like they haven't posted anything new in forever, you know, uh -huh. I just, to me, and maybe this again is the shit that I argue or bitch about all the fucking time. But a lot of those podcasts are very like uppity, like very hoity toity about the art that they, they talk about in a way that makes it not very inviting to non people of that ilk if that makes sense so yeah yeah I, d I definitely know what you're saying yeah like i'm surprised button poetry hasn't put together like a video podcast kind of thing i it, um they have a lot of good video a lot of good videos there's a lot of good poets that are have books through button 
it um but they, when you go to watch their you go to their YouTube channel it's just like a, a one poem by somebody it's just like a whole bunch of singular poems which yeah. is cool I like to but it's hard, it'd be I'm surprised they haven't gotten into the the more of the podcast more of the, like the long form video yeah I don't know from everything I hear from people like the new trend and I don't want to even say new because it's been happening for a while now but through like reels on Instagram and TikTok and fucking shorts on YouTube everything with poetry seems to be like what can you do in less than a minute you know like do something under a minute and it'll go viral fingers crossed you know yeah and that's cool you know but like there's people who fucking want more you know and so. maybe it's just me like the po what, what i've found on tiktok and stuff for poems mm -hmm. is like people that had just started writing poems like last year yeah which is fine it's just not like and I'm glad that uh, and they definitely should keep doing it and and they should keep making their TikToks and writing the poems. I definitely want them. I don't want them to stop. But I want. I, I'd love. I'd love to see somebody like Patricia Smith or like Brian Ellis or something, um, Jeffrey McDaniel, like some of the people that I really enjoy their poems. Yeah. Doing something like that. Honestly, there's such like from. Uh, like from like the academic circles there's such a stigma on like insta poetry that any kind of social media poetry anything like that's that quick is totally looked down upon yeah and i also wondered too how much of it is like the um the publishing companies like not wanting the poem avail freely available for people just to 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 read or I'm to sure, like to hear I'm part sure, of it. Yeah, I'm sure there's a part of it that is that, but at the same time, someone in their marketing department should say, "Hey, there's 42 fucking poems in this book. Can't we let them read one on a fucking reel or something to fucking try to get anyone fucking interested in this thing?" Yeah, there probably is somebody saying that, and it seems like they're getting met with a big fat no. <laughs> like. I like I know that button poetry is pretty like um they 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 don't want you doing anything that outside of outside of their control. So I have to assume that like Penguin Random House is the same way. Like if you have like your poems that are in button books, you, you're not going to see that poem also published somewhere else, which is weird to me. Like I I don't understand the 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 yeah, but I feel like I feel like a reading is different than the But poem. if it's but if it's like recorded somewhere that somebody can take with them, yeah, then they then they see that as merchandise. Well, that's where they fucked up. That is where they fucked up. I totally agree. It's okay for you to listen to Cannibal Corpse, but it's not okay for me to fucking write about drinking a beer. Like, what is your fucking problem, dude? Well, because that's too real. Like, I I see a lot of uptight people. I feel like listen to death metal. Because it's, it's like to them, it's like because it's total fantasy and it can't be taken in reality. That that that's what makes it different to them. Well, like, that's to them. I don't agree with there, them, there, but I think there, that's like there will that, that's be somebody. Standpoint. There will be somebody who's like, oh yeah, I want to do that because that song's fucking great, you know. Like, but just the, because... it kind of is now. There's like modern Vikings. The kind yeah. of <laughs> there's like this like um. Swedish or like something from that area, um, death metal band, Amen something, and um, one of their songs is like about rowing, and it's oh, like a uh, chant. A monomarth. Yes, yes, yeah. and like the whole He's crowd, the they'll yeah. sit down and like l and act like they're in a boat rowing. So like instead of a big mosh pit, they all sit down on the floor and act like they're rowing during the song. Oh my fucking god, dude. That's cringy as fuck, dude. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but Bukowski, he's got to calm down. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, that's fucking cringy as fuck, dude. God, what happened, man?
Shit. I, I don't know. People have read fucking Lord of the Rings too many times. <laughs> I guess to each their own, dude. And and I think that's the difference. Like I if people want to do dumb shit that I think's fucking stupid, I don't give a fuck. It doesn't keep me up at night. There's a bunch of fucking shitheads out there writing trash, clogging up the market, and just like and they're like they do it for a long period of time and then all of a sudden somebody thinks that they're like somebody to look up to, but really they've just been fucking putting out trash their whole lives. Yeah. I just, I feel like there's the whole, like the cream rises to the top thing, you know? Sure. Like, oh yeah, definitely. But there's so many middle, there's so many with poetry in, gen, in specifically, there's so many weird pockets that it's easy for some shithead to fucking take up space. I guess it's, with the internet now, that's less. That's it's less easy for, for that to happen. Yeah. But um, or more easy because like, anyone can do anything at any time. Right. Right. No, that's. So, so like, that, that's why it's, we. That's 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 why it's good to have some sort of filters for for the garbage. You know, like there's there's a lot of crap out there now that it's like anybody can make a book. There's a lot, like, Drake put, put out a fucking poetry book, you know? And, like, obviously people are going to take that, are going to buy that just because he's Drake and has a built-in audience. But people that like poetry are buying Drake's book instead of buying, like, Patricia Smith's book, you know? like. But see, like, the thing with that with me, I think that's awesome because it means people are buying fucking poetry books. And if they really dig it, Drake's not going to put out another poetry book next month. So maybe next month, like they'll buy my book, you know, like yeah, that's kind of how, like, I like as long as people are fucking reading poetry and buying poetry books, to me, that's great. That's like normalization of a dying fucking art, you know. No, I, I hear that, and I feel that in a lot of ways too. But I also see, I also see the point where there's, there's the market can only only t handle so much, you know. Yeah, and it's it 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 is great that the, the any kind of poetry being out there is good, but at the um at the same time that's why I feel like it's small presses and things things of that nature are super important are more important than ever. Yeah, because there needs to be there should be some sort of gatekeeping in a way, and it's just in in a sense for people to. To be like, oh, I like this sort of thing at, that's like at this quality level. So let me hunt out this press that continuously puts out different people of that in that in that vein. If you're just searching for people, there's too many people to search through to find good ones. But if you can just go to certain sources. Let me see. Like how much is too much? Like how much can the market not handle? I don't know, cause like I look at, cause like, like I think it can are... handle a lot of good poetry, mm -hmm. but then when there's too much, that isn't really that good. But that's the thing, because good is subjective, and there's going to be people who really like Drake's book that don't like Homer or who don't like T. S. Eliot. Sure, but they would like Nate Marshall, and he his stuff is. And even Drake would say is better, you know, like, I don't think Drake is out there, like, thinking he's like that great of a poet, you know, I, I don't, I don't even, I don't think anybody's really reading that book and being like, oh, wow, he should be just writing poetry. Like, I think they could get Rudy Francisco's book, and they would like his book just as much, if not more, probably more. And then from there would also find other. Well, then other that's, that's a problem of the publisher, because the publisher should have a page in Drake's book that says, if you like this book, you'll fucking love this dude and this dude, because it's right in the same vein. And even maybe have quotes from those dudes saying that this Drake book's cool. Well, yeah, so, different publishers, I guess, though, right? Well, depending on who the publishers are, but like a publisher's job is to sell the catalog. You know what I'm saying? So like if they put the Drake book out, and do not try to promote any other things that they have going on. That's their fault. That's their flaw. Because, like, you have someone who's excited, who probably never read poetry before in their life. They read the Drake book and then go, now what do I do? I really enjoyed this. 
oh well i guess i'll fucking just like go back to fucking playstation you know like you need to let them know that there's other things out there that they'd be into because if the next book they pick up is like rupee cower or atticus they might be like what the fuck is this shit yeah, they're only yeah. They're, well, they're only putting money into the same into the same people over and over again, which is yeah. like goes back to the the initial issue that we were talking about capitalism. Capitalism. Kind of hyper, hyper focusing on what has already produced. You know what is already. That's like why we see like so many remakes. You know because that has a built-in audience so that anything that has a built-in audience is what they're putting money into that's the episode with jeff i hope you enjoyed it he's fun to fucking talk to so if you haven't gone to the garage poets yet um i think um as of this recording uh the next garage poets is going to be the friday after thanksgiving so look for the garage poets on facebook all of the zoom information is on there and you should definitely go and do the fireside thing and just hang out with everybody for a bit it's good times i need to make more time to do these things before i forget okay so abnormal brain this recording is sunday okay of whatever fucking month this is the sunday before thanksgiving i only have two of these left okay so as of today so if you go on my etsy and you don't see any hit me up on instagram or email me if you want one i don't know if they'll even be here anymore but let's give thanks to where thanks is do got so first off i want to give a thank you to my motherfuckers over there on patreon i want to give a thank you to michael to cedar to harry to monse you guys are the shit over in the youtube thank you crew I want to give a big thank you to Patrick, to Britt, to Jan, to Deb, to Ethan, to Julia, to Lauren, and to Booknick. Thank you. Um, over in the Anarchy Crew, I want to give a big thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Minnie, to Thomas, to Tim J, to Shaylin, to Tim G, to Chill Baby, to Tamara, to Adam, to Chase, to JH, to Jessica, to Jason, to Jeff, and to Cedar. And like always, I want to give the biggest thank you over there to the number one chappy over there in the Chappica Month Club, Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here and doing this. There will be another episode hopefully sometime this week. And let me get the fuck out of here. And until next time, everybody, type hard, keep buying my books, and I'll talk to you all later. Just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Creo and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.